but this has to do with reconciliation. I'm just sorry that I forgot to say that uh, the sessions are recorded because it's part of the Erasmus Plus project. We should record and also part, we have a channel. Sorry to disturb you, Professor. We have a channel on YouTube for only students, not anyone else. Not public, but private, where students can go into all the sessions and study for writing their proposals and their dissertations. So thank you, Professor. I'm sorry for the disruption. No problem, Lord. So when I was thinking about what I can contribute to reconciliation from my work, it was very interesting to, dis to discover how much reconciliation could be a perspective I can take to have another different, a very productive look on what I've done so far. Today, I want to present some ideas I had when I thought about the link between memory and reconciliation. And maybe some reflections may come out of that, how reconciliation can also be described or analyzed as memory work. So I think bringing together those two perspectives could be a very fruitful interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach. And also an approach that would permit to collaborate very closely between cultural studies and philosophy, uh, philology on the one hand, and social sciences, on the other hand, to investigate reconciliation. What I want to do today is to speak uh, in three parts about cultural memory studies and reconciliation. In the first part, I want to lay out some theoretical notions. People who have studied memory before might be familiar with, with most of it, but as we are from different disciplines, I thought it might be useful to come back to some theoretical notions about how memory is conceived as part of collective identity building. Then I will narrow it down in part of my research as a film scholar. I will look at the role of film, of movies for cultural memory and reconciliation. And in the greatest part of my talk, I will present you a case study on the early years after World War II in Europe, the 50s and 60s, and reflect with you on the topic of how far or how reconciliation can be considered the third space in post war Europe, or how a third space could be established to discuss reconciliation in a time after the Second World War. When we look into theory of cultural memory studies, we have four major aspects or concepts I want to present to you. Two pioneer studies who forge the notion of cultural memory as we use it today, and two more recent approaches uh, who help us to understand what memory studies mean in our days. The first person I want to make you acquainted with is a guy called Abi Barburg. He was working in art history and he was working on the aesthetic dimension of memory and the role of media, of art, in the tra transmission of traditions, in what we know about the past. Abi Barburg, who lived out from 1866 to 1929, is quite famous in cultural studies. For memory studies, his most important project was his picture atlas, Nemozyne. No idea how to pronounce it in English, but I hope it's okay. So Nemozyne, which was the muse of memory in the ancient Greek mythology. So Nemozyne is a girl in mythology, and she's responsible for the memory, which was part of the arts in ancient Greek. And Warburg said that he was surprised to discover some postures, some motifs in contemporary artwork that were exactly the same he had seen in ancient Greece or Rome. And he wanted to establish the connection between those statues that were dig out in Rome or Athens or elsewhere in the antique world and contemporary artwork. And in his atlas, atlas is like a book of maps for countries, but he did it for these artworks. He tried to associate different pictures of art uh, that express the same kind of posture of feeling. And he wanted to show that some motifs travel through the centuries and millenaries, millionaires of art history to give us a direct connection between the ancient Greek world and our world. For instance, if a very beautiful woman is depicted in a posture we appreciate even today, we can find the same postures in artwork today. And he did these huge tables 
with those pictures. There was a recent exhibition in Berlin about it. Here you see how, how it is presented in the book. It's smaller, but you see his work. All his study was full of these association, these tableaus of pictures. We had tried to establish what is called formula of pathos, pathos formula that are transmitted through the centuries. So what we learn from Abi book is that memory is linked to media. And thanks to media, we have access to knowledge, to cultural knowledge, and to feelings across the generations and, and centuries. A second very important scholar in this field has more worked on the social dimension of memory. His name was Maurice Halbwachs. He lived until uh, 1945, and he has a sad history closely linked to Jena in a way, because he has died, he died in the concentration camp of Buchenwald, which is just 20 minutes away from Jena. He was a French sociologist, and his interest was in how identity is formed in groups, in collectives. So he ex explored the role of social settings for memory. In his two works, Collective Memory, which was published after his death in 1950, and The Social Frames of Memory in 25 and later on 52, he worked on that. And what did, does he mean by social frames? Those of you who are used to sociological studies might have heard of Goffman's use of frame or media frames. It's a bit the same in Halbwachs's case. For him, a frame is a frame in which you can remember something. You all might be a member of different groups, for instance, in a sports club. If you're in a sports club, you gather in, I don't know, always the same restaurant or you have a bar close by your sports uh, place and so on, where you speak about the endeavors of your club. So you speak about the famous victories or the, um, uh, the, the very hard losses you had, defeats. And you will remember always that. And the frame for this remembering is the social context of the people around or in your families. We are here in Europe now approaching uh, Christmas time. We use Christmas remem to remember some things about our families and we need the others to remember it. Without speaking about it, it cannot be become part of the collective memory of a group. So with Abi Warburg, we have the media. With Halbwax, we have the social structure of memory, the people we need, the talk we need to make something relevant from the past. If nobody speaks about uh, Warburg's sculptures, nobody takes them as important for their life, their identity today. In more recent years, two main main uh, concepts have been developed. The first is the term of sites of memory by French historian Pierre Nora. The second one is the term of cultural memory forged by two German scholars. But let's come first to Pierre Nora and the French contribution to that history. Pierre Nora was a historian, is, he's still alive, but he was alive two weeks ago. I had to check back in the media if he's died. He's born in the early 30s, so uh, over 90 years old. Pierre Nora had a huge research project called Les Lieux de Mémoire, the sites of memory, which took him over 12 years to, um, uh, uh, no, it's not eight, it was just eight years, eight years, to bring out three huge books. What did he do? He tried to make a list of all sites of memory important to France with many, many, many colleagues. In his theoretical approach, he tried to explain why this endeavor was important to him. He makes a very important distinction between l'histoire, la mémoire, and le passé, between history, memory, and the past. History for him is what the historian tried to do, to write an official history of something. But history is not directly what the past has been because it's selective. Historians cannot cover all the history. They don't have the sources. Many things pass every day. Everything happens every day. Nobody notes it. So historians don't have access to it. So history is just a selection out of it. And between that, you have memory. Memory is what we remember actively, what we recall when we speak about events, about our past, what we will do at Christmas, for instance, again. 
To him, the fact that we uh, live in a modern society means that we have lost access to memory. He explains it, this is the translation of the French I had on the slide before, he explains it like that. Our interest in lieu de mémoire, where memory crystallizes and secrets itself, has occurred at a particular historical moment, a turning point where consciousness of a break with the past is bound up with the sense that memory has been torn, but torn in such a way as to pose the problem of the embodiment of memory in certain sites where a sense of historical continu continuity persists. There are lieu de mémoire sites of memory because there are no longer milieu de mémoire, real environments of memory. To him, milieu de mémoire, real environments of memory, where live, living oral societies, where people gathered around the campfire and evenings and nights and were telling stories about their past. So always remembering who they are and so on. He says, as we don't have this tradition anymore, we live more in an individual, individual, individualized society, we need sites to remember. And sites for him are ruins, uh, monuments, books, everything that is a pretext, help us would say social frame that allows us to remember. Um, sites of memory can also be something but that is not material. For him, a millet of silence with respect to honor the death is a site of memory too. So it's a very large notion. National anthems are sites of memory. It's always a pretext needed as somebody uh, 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 a material access to memory. So we need these sites. And as you know, we don't cover all the possible sites. Wherever you live, there are many sites of memory, architectural ones, other ones around you. But even though you might know very well just the city or village you live in, you won't be able to call to, to tell a story about every site of memory in there. So it's also something very selective. And this kind of selectiveness is at the core of the thinking of the two next um, scholars I want to present in this theoretic part. The two are called Jan and Aleida Asman. You see the name written down in the source here. And he is a, an Egyptologist working on ancient cultures. And she was, or she's still working on English and American literature. And they both work together to explore more how memory works in a society. They distinguish three levels of memory. The first one is very simple. It's our individual memory, which refers to our inner self, our inner truth we, we carry in us. Then we have a social level, which refers to a group we are in. So the self as a part of a group where we carry a number of social roles. Your inner self, you might all know, is not in all case the same as your public self we have in this social context. And we have the cultural level where we refer to a more mythical, historical, cultural time, which is broader and which refers to our cultural identity and is manifest in what they call a cultural memory. I will now go more into details of this com communicative and cultural memory part. Um, if we want to draw those two memories, we have the cultural memory and the communicative memory, which are part of that overlaps. In the cultural memory, we have all sites of memory that are potentially accessible, even though they might not be discovered yet. So maybe we are just sitting on a huge treasure of ancient civilizations we haven't discovered yet because nobody has dig, dig out it at the place we are just above now. But this would also be part of cultural memory because we could dig it up one day. Or we have huge archives in museums and libraries and nobody knows exactly what's in there. In museums, even though they might have a good order systems, ordering system, they discover new things all the time. And all this, this potential uh, content of cultural memory is part of cultural memory. In the communicative memory, we have everything that is remembered Orally, we can recall ourselves, and usually it has a, an expiration date. A cognitive mem memory, according to Asman, never goes back further than three generation, generations. 
three generations, which means 80 to 100 years. And that it's true for most societies, for most families, for instance. If you try to remember what your grandparents did, how they were called, what their professions were, where they lived, usually you will remember that. But if you think about your great-grandparents, you will have some difficulties to find out exactly what did they do as a profession? Where did they live? Where did they come from? If you go one generation back, it's even more difficult to come up with details. So this is communicative memory. Both kinds of memory, both modes of cultural memory are linked to public, uh, to different kinds of media. So the media for cultural memory are in, as I said, museums, archives, it's in artwork, books or monument and so on. And for the communicative memory, we use private media. That might be photographs, postcards, letters, emails, or social media postings today. All that forms part of our memory. Let's now come to the overlapping part. We have some memories that overlap with history. If you think about um, what, ha what just happened last year in Europe was that the first, the last people who have lived the Second World War are dying. There are some testimonies left. Uh, te uh, some left, some witnesses left, but they are dying now. So we have a shift from community memory to cultural memory. And still we have this overlap where people can remember what has happened, but it, for most time it's already in the archives, in the museum. Same is happening for the 60s right now, the memory of May 68. It's fading away. We have official mem memory, we have historians working on it, and so on. At the same time, we have private memories uh, recalling it. A third notion, and the last theoretical one I want to bring up here, is that of functional memory. Functional memory, according to Asman and Asman, is the part of memory we have access to it at a certain moment. That means we have access now to our social memories, our cognitive memories on an individual level, so what is talked about in our societies, but also to a part of the cultural memory, which is remembered right now. Speaking about Germany, we are well aware of the importance of poets and writers like Goethe, for instance, or Schiller, which is who is very dear to Jena, as you know, by the name of university. Or we are aware of Christmas. We are aware of uh, buildings uh, around us, cathedrals and so on, but not everything. And this part of memory which is accessible to society at a certain moment is called functional memory. memory. So far for the first theoretical guidelines, broad overview about uh, key concepts in cultural memory studies. Let's come to a more practical part, fields of cultural memory. According to political uh, scientist Peter Reichel, we can distinguish four major fields where cultural memory comes into play in a society. We have a political and legal field, the field of public commemorations, then historical research, and aesthetic culture. All those fields, of course, are interconnected. I will dig into the four fields to give you some examples to make it a bit more vivid here. On the political and legal field, we could quote here, as example, the Frankfurt Auschwitz trials in the early 60s, called Auschwitz Prozesse in Germany. In those trials, where some of the SS people having worked in concentration camps were tried, um, the public got aware of what happened in, in Auschwitz. So it was the legal field intervening in how we remember the time of Second World War. Before that, the Holocaust was not so much prominent in the German memory culture. An example from France from the same era is the trial of Papon, Maurice Papon, who um, was a high highest public servant in uh, Vichy, the collaborationist regime that collaborated with the Nazis during the occupation of France in the 1940, and he was responsible for de the deportation of hundreds of people. And he was only tried more than 50 years after the awards in 1998, and this dig dug up, in a way, the responsibility of France as a nation, as politics, in the collaboration with uh, Nazi Germany at the time. A more recent example from the post-colonial context is that one, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, 
which siege from 2008, 2015, to find out about what had happened to indigenous people in Canada. Uh, you have heard about the pension schools, probably um, where children were mistreated by, uh, by Catholic uh, nuns and, and priests mainly, and the graveyards that came up where many children were buried around those pension schools. And this commission was there to, to, to find out the truth. And it's a political measure to influence how we remember the past. In Spain, you could quote the Valle de los Caídos, a memory site by the Franco regime, the dictatorship, uh, and Falange used these sites to remember their view on history. And we have now political movements to change that. They changed last year the name from Valle de los Caídos in, into Valle de Cuelga Muros. Uh, so to an original name, and they transferred the bones of the, the dictator Franco from there to another place to avoid to make it a place of memory for the Franco time. Let's switch to the second field, public commemoration. One example you might all have heard about is the Memorial to the Murder Jews of Europe, which has been um, erected in the center of Berlin in 2004. Another one would be the parades on May 8th, the end of Second World War. Here, the example from far France, where the military parade takes place in the Arc de Triomphe, and then the president will put flowers on the grave of the unknown soldier, which is buried just under the, the arc you see on the picture. So this is an example of public commemoration. Historical research has often had a major influence on the way memory evolved and has been considered. One example is Robert Paxton's study on Vichy France, Old Guard and New Order, 1940 to 1944. It's an American historian who was the first to speak about collaboration between the French and the German Nazis at that time. And his study was had such an impact that many historians in France started to get interest into the period and change the way we look at that period right now. Another example from Germany would be the historical stride, the struggle of the historians in the late 80s, where historians had a very intensive public debate, debate in newspapers and so on about the question if the Holocaust is something unique and just one genocide among others. It's a debate which is still going on, but at the time they agreed that it was a unique event in history and that forged the way we speak about it today. More recent examples on the right hand side about the restitution of um, artwork, of objects stolen or taken at least during the time of colonization from the colonies, from the former colonies, and presented now in museums worldwide in the North, like in Europe or in the United States. And the debates how to restitute them to the countries it comes from um, are quite, um, quite ongoing. Now. For aesthetic culture, three less, uh, less um, controversial examples, three major books from the three European countries. We have here the Don Quixote by Cervantes at, from 1605, La Divina Commedia, de Dante Alighieri, a uh, very important book for Italy. And then Victor Hugo spoke Notre Dame de Paris, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. You have many, you had at least seen the Disney movie from it, I suppose, which is also part of the French cultural memory from the aesthetic point of view. Or we could quote uh, monuments like the Humboldt Forum in Berlin. You might not heard about it, but it's the ancient ancient palace of the German emperors at the late 90s, 19th century, which has just been reconstructed and built up again to make it visible where nothing was visible before. So they created a site of memory, aesthetic culture, to remember it. And before nobody knew it was there, if you have not been informed by historical books, now you can see it. Those were just four examples for those fields of memories um, that are, of course, interconnected, as you have seen. So the historical research 
impacts on public commemoration because if they dig up something from history, we have to take into account, we change our, our monuments and so on. And monuments, public commemoration are part of aesthetic culture. Um, if it's national one, politics have to decide if we can erect a monument or not. So they are interconnected, but there might also be conflicts between the different perspectives on memory. I have hinted at some of them in what I've just said before. But there are more potential conflicts when we look at the social dimension and family dimension of memory, because what we remember in our families might be different from what the official memory means. That it's very clear in times of conflict and reconciliation. And you have two sides, two perspectives on the questions, of course. Um, somebody will not agree on what is publicly remembered or not. A second field of tension is the international intercultural dimension of it. Because history is still told in a national framework mainly. And uh, if you have an outside perspective, you might not agree with it. And many sides of memory are linked to conflicts, to war, and to reconciliation, and there are always different parties in it. And you are all aware that a war is not remembered in the same in the same terms in the uh, by the adversaries. So that's also a challenge to memory. Um, Post-colonial memory is one of those fields, for, exa uh, for example. I've cut out here a number of examples. If you need them in the discussion, we come back to them. But I want to move to some examples from, a, from the aesthetic field of memory, film as a vector of memory, so we dig into aesthetic culture. Um, films and movies are part of fictional media, like book, novels, and so on, and offer us visions about the past about the present and the future of our societies. Film and other media therefore participate in the construction of cultural identities or imagined communities to speak with Benedict Anderson. So in public, in media and cultural media, we have reflections on what society could have been, is, or could be in the future. And it's an occasion to discussing it, to see if it's a potential way for us to move on. Movies can suggest imaginary societies or imagined societies as a test to discuss how a group sees itself and project itself into the future. We are therefore in the field of storytelling, which is central for identity constructions, but also for create a a shared understanding or common ground in intercultural communication and also in reconciliation. So if we agree on a mem on a perspective of the past in memory culture, it's also a good way to um, pursue together our way as a group. Before looking at specific movies, just let me just situate it rapidly. Oh, there's a typo in there. It's specific movie, not specific move. So if you have a film at the core, in a moment we'll come to the question, yes, uh, at the core, you have to consider also that a film is never a standalone thing. It's always in a context. And we have a first context, which is the filmic context. So he's in relationship to other films uh, and the reception of those movies. But we are also in a broader societal context where such a film discussion or such a media discussion takes place. And those are different levels I will try to take into um, account. Yes, Zina, you had a question. Um, yeah, I want to ask about the religious memory. Where can we put the uh, under cultural or political or it's another memory, religious? It's all religious the religious. part of all of that. Religious memory is expressed through public commemoration by services, for instance, by prayer. It's part of historical research. There's religion scientists who are dig into it to try to understand better. It's part of um, um, uh, the political legal field because it's regulated by politics and uh, laws and is expressed through aesthetic culture, you have religious art. So it's transmitted by all those factors also. And you have, of course, the same conflictual uh, dimensions that can interfere. Did that answer the question? 
Yeah, thank you. Um, let's come back. Yes, so I see here films as an expression of memory culture. At the moment, the film got out was uh, was uh, made, but films are also impacting our way we see the part and are part of memory building. The content part of film is in the tradition of Warburg. The reception context of film is in the context of social, the so dimension of memory, like in uh, Halbwerks. And we have sometimes films that can go into public commemoration and memory depends on what's done. And there has also been some uh, law struggles about some movies, but I won't speak about it. So we need this context because the film nobody sees, nobody speaks about, has no impact on memory and identity. That's quite clear, but uh, I wanted to stress this because people in my field also tend to work on works nobody knows knows has read, nobody has read or nobody has seen. In my case study, I want to look into some examples on memory work on reconciliation in the specific period of post-war Europe. And I will take the example of France and Germany to look at it. Just to give you some, it's not very important to have all the details of this very complicated um, a slide some context about France and Germany were treating Second World War. We see here an overview how memory of the, this period has evolved over the years. But what is important for us is that we don't have a, a parallelism between both evolutions. So we had in France a very early consciousness about what's happening and the shift in the 60s and 70s, and we have a long period of not considering uh, complexity in the memory of Second World War in France, and the later breaking of national consensus in the early 70s. So the ways remember period are not the same at a given time. The reasons behind that, just to give one, is that Germany was forced by the Allies under the occupation to deal differently with his past, its past, than France could do it as a, one of the victory, vict, uh, victory nations. The political context we are in, and here I'm also very, very roughly going over a very complicated period, is that when we are in the middle of Cold War and in debates about the rearmament of the West, of Western Germany's army and the integration of the Bundeswehr, the German army, into NATO. So we're debating about if Germany could participate as part of the bloc in the West in wars and so on. But in France, France, the goal, the general de Gaulle, he was the president uh, from the late 50s to the early 70s and the Fifth Republic, where nationalism was a big issue. And for de Gaulle, and you see him with the German Chancellor Adenauer on this photograph on the right hand side, the European integration and the Franco-German friendship was something very important. A very important step into European integration was the Treaty of Rome from 1957. And for the German-Franco reconciliation, it was the Elysee Treaty, the Franco-German Friendship Treaty from 63. So we are in a time where people try politically to reconcile the way to come together. As far as the memory of World War II is concerned, we have on one hand side uh, ways of looking at the Holocaust, for instance, in the Auschwitz trial in Frankfurt in 63 to 65, but at the same time, we have compute, competing discourses of in Germany where most Germans were seen as victims of Nazis and didn't see themselves so much as part of the problem. In France, we have the same thing where collaboration between Germans and French between the war was not an issue. And most uh, ways of remembering Second World War in France were linked to resist resistance against the Nazi oppressors. And the last context, which is important here, is that we are in the period of decolonization, which in the late 50s and early 60s translates for France mainly for a war in Algeria um, that influences the way the way the past is seen. 
For the cinematographic context, there's a dominant tendency in German cinema of the 50s and early 60s, we call it the Heimat film. It's a kind of um, friendly, boring cinema where people live in beautiful environments in the nature and uh, marry happily and so on, where no problems happened and so on. If you like very kitschy movies uh, in the Bollywood style, without Bollywood, without dancing, more boring, watch those Heimat films. I think you can find plenty of them on YouTube and so on. But we also have a, a whole wave, wave of war movies in Germany, France, and the US, in other countries too, but those are the countries I've looked into. And in many of those war movies, we have adventure elements, and German soldiers, as most soldiers, are mainly shown as positive heroes or as victims of the war. The model for the representation of German soldiers as heroes is mainly a very known Hollywood film called The Desert Fox by Hathaway from 51. It's about a German marshal who led the German forces in the Libyan desert at the time called Erwin Rommel, who was a, a huge war hero um, for Germany in the Nazi time and a very ambivalent, a big ambiguous uh, figure in memory culture too. This was just a brief introduction. I want to show you now some examples of movies. The first one I put out is The Star of Africa, a German film from 1952. And you see here what's about, it's about war. This movie, I check, let me check the time. Yes, I can maybe show you. No, we show you, don't we show you. No, I won't show you the, the trailer here for the next movie, we'll show you the trailer. Uh, this is an example for the dominant discourse in popular movies about the war at the end of the 50s and the early 60s. It's a war movie, which takes place in the uh, North African campaign. And in this, no this North African campaign, we have this myth of Rommel coming up, who was called the Desert Fox, fox the, the Wüsten Fox, and um, he was very charismatic in the Nazi time and, and beyond. And he story was told as the story from Hitler's fam, favorite to resistance because he was very fa much favored by Hitler as one of his favorite generals. And then he moved over becoming critical towards Hitler and was considered as a resistant. Historians are quite sure today that he was against Hitler. He was really involved in any uh, attempts to attack Hitler, it's not so clear. The African campaign is very important too because the Africa Corps was known just for its heroism, chivalry, and the war in Africa was considered a war without hatred where the European nations could confront each other without hate. That's a bit absurd in the notion, but it meant, it meant without any war crimes and difficulties for the civil societies because the people living there in North Africa were not considered as really important not to harm and so on. So it was considered like a clean war in a way. And this is the reason why this African campaign and the African continent could serve as a good setting to celebrate in an innocent way war and its heroes even after the war on neutral ground. So you could avoid speaking about crimes committed by soldier war crimes. You could uh, show just uh, how the, their endeavor between um, soldiers were all alike leads to winners and losers and so on. And Weidemann's movie is in there. The Star of Africa you see here is an example of this discourse. Just these photos <clears throat> from the advertisements for the film and uh, Maybe Professor Lyon is aware of the actors in there. Many in Germany from not the very young generations know Hans-Jörg Felmi and so on. Uh, they're all in there. And uh, when I showed to an old secretary what I was working on, she had, uh, uh, she, has, she was always crying because it were her childhood stars depicted here. Yeah, she was in love with them. Um, what we have here is the stories of Hans-Jörg Marseille, a real, a uh, pilot who, who shot down many other pilots and was celebrated by Hitler, Mussolini, and so on. 
But all that, that doesn't take place. He's always in the desert flying around and killing other soldiers, and you hardly see the victims on the other side. However, what you see is that you are on neutral ground. And now I'll show you an example. Um, I have to switch windows here, which is not of best quality. I apologize, but it's, uh, I had to take it from YouTube. Um, and it shows you how the local population is depicted. And just to give you the setting, the film takes place in today's Libya. And uh, so we are quite far from Sub-Saharan Africa. And the only not white person depicted is a German singer who had his first appearance in a movie here called Roberto Blanco. It's not his real name. And he's from Cuba originally. And here he plays the helper, uh, the local helper, Matthias. And uh, you will see how his he is depicted in the movie. I said it's the very first time he was in the media. So I we just... are not seeing the movie, Professor. Yes, yes, I know. I have to change the Freigabe. Okay. Now you see it? Yes, yes. 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 I don't know if you have sound attested. We'll see. Yeah, the sound is not, we can't hear sound. Not so important the sound. Okay, the sound is not important, it's good. So far for that. Let's come back to the other screen. So what you've seen was a very racist representation here of the only black actor, but I wanted to show it not to perpetuate racist pictures, but to show you how he was objectivized. He's only seen as a body dancing body. And if you haven't seen the, if you haven't understood the, the dialogue, he's offered a personal servant of the successful pilot fighter fighter pilot. And then again, he's there for entertainment and so on. And it's the only moment where you see something from the local, if it's, it's not really local, he's coming from, he's originally from Cuba, uh, the actor, the local environment, except desert. The rest, we see only desert, which means sand, nothing as sand. Um, my thesis is that you need this background of the African campaign to, to show racism like that, to show war heroes like that, without debating, without discussing the road has today. And we go one step further and look to another example, which is close linked to reconciliation, because Weidemann's depiction here is clearly not something we, you would use to reconcile, reconcile peoples after a war, because it's the Germans celebrating German victories and German heroes and so on. The second example is the movie, uh, European co-production from 1960 by Denis de la Taxi nach Tobruk, a Taxi for Tobruk, Taxi for Tobruk. It's a very famous movie with an all a star cast from the time. And again, I will show you this time the entire trailer of the movie. 
Um, it's with English subtitles and uh, it gives a quite, I think, good overview of about the movie. No, no sound. Si vous n'aimez pas la guerre, pourquoi signez-vous des alliances militaires avec des pays qui sont en guerre tous les 20 ans Signez plutôt avec la Suisse ou le Luxembourg Mon cher Ludwig, vous connaissez mal les Français. Dans le contexte de la liberté, ça date de 89. Nous avons égorgé la moitié de l'Europe au nom de ce principe. Le vice Napoléon a écrasé la Pologne. Nous ne supportons pas que quiconque le fasse à notre place. Nous aurions l'impression d'être frustrés. Il boira et il bougera comme l'eau. Alors, tout de suite. Un petit, on te regarde. Tranquille, pas de hein Et tout dans le masque Il y en a là-dedans. Un peu, figure-toi. C'est sous l'acte de triomphe que j'aurais voulu que vous m'installiez. C'est con que la place soit déjà prise. Sorry for the sound, for, that, for no sound, there's always a problem when you are on Zoom online. Um, but I think you have the impression it was subtitled. What we have here, just to give you an overview of the main characters, we have uh, the main character, Hauptmann von Stegel, a German officer, um, a corporal, son, present a son, father, husband, and a sincere old school soldier and the kind of honest soldier who is fighting for values of an army, not for Nazi values. Uh, and uh, he was depicted by the critique and by the scholars afterwards as a Rommel type. So taking up this idea of the desert fox. He was cast by Hardy Krüger. Sorry, there's typo in there. Very famous German actor who was specialized in this kind of war roles all over his career in the 50s to 70s. And then we have four French resistance fighters in the French army who are from very different backgrounds, as you see. Um, I won't go into details, but we have all kinds of motivations why we would engage in the Force Francaise Libre, so the three forces fighting in Africa. Um, we have here a broad representation of resistance and different motivations for engagement. We have a political communist who wants to fight in fascism for political reasons, a Jew he wants to, who wants more revenge against germs, one who search, seeks for adventure, one intellectual, and so on. That shows us that the four people represent a whole 
bunch of people, a society in a way as a whole. And on the German side, we have a good soldier and person in a corrupted regime, so it's possible to interact with him. So what's happened in the uh, in the story is that this German soldier is captured in the desert by the French patrolling, patrol, patrol, patrolling around here, and he's captured here, and they got lost in the desert. They don't know where to go. So we have first confrontation and mistrust when the German is captured by them, and they have to continue the journey together. And first, when they discover they are lost, they don't want to take him with them because he's a threat to the, the water they have, the provision they have, and so on. But then they need him as an expert because he knows, he has technical knowledge that helps them to come out. And this technical knowledge helps them to get closer together. So we have rapprochement. At one moment, you have a turning point where the German gets the weapon and holds the others um, here, um, uh, the, pointing the weapon on them to control them. But of course, he will fall asleep in a moment and the situation will turn around. And he will be captured again. But now they are, have a very, very trusting relationship with each, each other. And from danger to danger, they go through it and they help each other to survive here. You, you see the picture of a minefield they have to cross. They become closer friends. And finally, you see it also on a visual level. They take off their uniforms, use the naked bodies. They are all human in a way, and you have human equality, which is depicted. At the end, the movie is not so funny anymore as the trailer suggests. The final scene is that one. They go around. And they are, they are attacked by friendly fire because on, in the meantime, they have changed the national symbols on the, on the car they have because they had to go through the German zone and so on. So they are not recognized as somebody who's part of the good ones, the Allied army. So they are killed. And the only survivor is this one, the guy played by Lino Ventura. And the very last scene is a th scene about memory. We are the 8th of May in '45 in France on the French uh, on the Champs-Élysées in Paris and the final victory parade takes place and you have the soldier here that is now a civil person and he can't be happy because his friend and all the, the good germ is dead so it's a story about sacrifice victimhood in the war and everybody has to can agree on that idea that everybody has suffered Let's come to the last theoretical notion to the end of my presentation, third space, which might have confused you. you have seen it in the title. Third space is a theoretical notion influenced by a number of scholars from structuralism by Foucault and uh, to, to, to post-colonial theory by Homer Baba. Third space means spaces where cultures meet, where rules are new, uh, are newly negotiated. There are different examples of the spaces. It might be convention halls, conferences where we gather together and can we are like in a culture free space to negotiate. It might be political negotiations, like here we have the meeting between Gorbachev and Kohl to prepare the German unity. You might have hotels, but also international affairs. Like here you have the Atomium in Brussels, which was uh, built for the Expo the Universal Exposition um, in the 50s. Characteristic of third space are that third spaces are open, flexible, and are rooms for tolerance. Usually, you have no hierarchies. People use what can be called as-if communication. They kind of engage into a playful dialogue and can negotiate what would happen if I did that and that, and what would you do then? And third spaces are marked by movement, evolution, and change. They allow the presence of emotions because they are mostly in a closed room. So many negotiations take place in that. And if you have fight it, reconciliation also takes place in a kind of third space where you try to get rid of all that influence from the original conflict parties. In Taxi to Tobruk, we have a number of elements from third space. First, the desert, which is presented as an empty space where you can negotiate differently uh, than it would, be, would have been in Paris or in Berlin, for instance. We are on neutral grounds. 
with an unknown, strange, and hostile environment for everybody. So they have to fear, uh, to, to, to confront the same fears and the same dangers. The country of origin, the culture of origin with its norms, rules, and habits is not efficient in that space because it's so different. And so therefore, culture is suspended in a way and they have to renegotiate re rules, manners, and so on. The strategies deployed by the people, the par characters of Taxi to the Vogue, are that they play on multiple belongings. Most of the characters are presented, of course, as member of a culture or nation, but at the same time, they have roles as soldier or officer, roles of men, families, and so on. They get a more complex personality and different social roles that are explored and tested. So they can confront and meet on different levels. They use humor to find common ground and as if communication. We have lots of meta communicative strategies, which mean that they try to find out what are common points between them. Um, yes, hierarchies are out of order. Another example here uh, you see, because in this situation you have to survive, the, the military hierarchies don't work anymore. Um, what can we make out of those examples? Movies in post-war Europe participated in the continuation and consolidation of traditional national narratives. We have seen that in the example of the Star of Africa. It was uh, possible to depict things that are not so much sayable in public anymore because they could use the third space of Africa to speak about it. It would not be possible to show a German war hero, a Nazi war hero in the 50s in the setting of Germany. Uh, movies in post-war Europe, in post-war Europe, allowed to explore new spaces and to test new stories in a reconciliation perspective. The taxi of uh, for Topol's story, such a new story that was told and explored from a European perspective because many European countries participated in the movies. Something that I didn't explore here was that post-war movies also helped counter memories to gain visibility. There were memories that were suppressed before that came up at that time in the late 60s. And I think one thing that was very uh, obvious for me that reconciliation can be analyzed as memory work or through memory work. So I think memory and cultural memory plays an important part in all reconciliation attempts and all ways if you want to approach reconciliation on theoretical level. Let me finish with a quick outlook. When I was preparing that, I was thinking about how reconciliation narratives change over time. And as I'm quite active in the German-Franco uh, community, the German-French friendship and so on, I asked myself if reconciliation narratives have an expi expiration date, why? We have a current debate going on in the context of Franco-German cooperation, where reconciliation has also been a key story that has been told and retold innumerable times. In most meetings, celebrations of French and German gatherings, the same narrative was told and retold. That means how hereditary enemies with an entangled history of three wars and so on have become very close hereditary friends, best buddies. And this was one of the main motivations for the engagements of so many actors from the civil society in the network of Franco-German relations. So for many years, for decades, people said, oh, I want to be into these networks of Franco-German reconciliation because of the war, we have to reconcile. However, this story of, a, of reconciliation as a dominant narrative doesn't seem to work as good anymore for younger generations. So what could be a new story to be told? Or does an end of an era of reconciliation means also a throwback for the mutual networks and net relationships? Can we relive reconciliation when we are beyond reconciliation? I don't have an answer, but for the movies, we can observe a tendency that movies speaking about this reconciliation after the war are more univer universalized now than they have been before. 
more recent examples of movies are seen as not so much seen as comments to history and memory anymore, but as universal attempts to speak about friendship and collaboration, about loss and suffering, a bit like in Taxi to Topo. So thank you very much. I hope that it you could follow less or more, and I'm happy to take your questions, comments, and uh, perspectives. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. I wanted uh, to, if we can take a break, it would be a very good idea. And I think a break would be uh, uh, for. Ayad, we can't hear you now. Can you hear me now? Now we can hear you. Yeah. Go ahead. You, you, yeah. we, we, we can take break. a break for five minutes and then <laughs> for 10 minutes, I guess. Uh, and then we can come back to questions and answers, oh. I guess. It's much better so we can be more flexible. What do you think, Professor Rafater? Are you, are you ready for five, 10 minutes a break or, or five minutes break? What do you think? It's okay. Okay, let's take 10 minutes break. So it's 3.15 here, 3.25. So we can have a, a break and then we come back to questions and answers. 